Today, we're in the test kitchen demonstrating some dangerous kitchen tasks. Sometimes the kitchen can feel really intimidating. I mean, the fact that like we're allowed to like pipe combustible gas into our homes and then like light it on fire. I've burnt myself more times than I can count. If your knife is dull, that to me is really dangerous. I've cut fingers, I've burnt hands, I've burnt a lot of food. We definitely learn from the scars and burns we've had. The important thing is to learn the tips and tricks to be able to navigate the kitchen successfully. The dangerous task is using a blowtorch yes. as a cooking apparatus. It's like any other tool. You have to kind of know how to use it. Yes. It's obviously dangerous because you're working with a flame. Anytime you have or you're thinking about words like caramelization, charring, even roasting or anything color is kind of like where this could be an additional help or just the main thing. Certain blow torches will have different safety mechanisms. This one is off already because um, it's all the way to the right, righty tighty. And then when you move it to the left, which there is a plus sign dial. So there that's telling you that you're turning it on and you're also controlling your heat. As soon as you turn it on, you hear the gas go on. You never want to point the flame towards you like or like light a cigarette or whatever. Like this is like, you know, like see that blue flame yes. that's ensuring that you have good enough that's gas. Neat. Because if you don't, it can kind of impart like a weird taste. Yes. Gas taste. I, that's happened before. Yeah. Make sure you have like plenty of space and that there's nothing that's like really flammable wow. around. One of my favorite ways to use a torch is on fish. I love mackerel, I love serving it raw, I love braising it, cooking it, searing it. You're gonna know how to adjust your uh, flame, like meaning like how close you should get to the fish, but also like how fast it's roasting. You can also score this fish so that it kind of makes like little patterns too. If you go to some sushi places, you'll see this apparatus a lot. The fat is rising which means like the, the cookery is happening, the cookery. Um, <laughs> the great thing about a torch is that it's in your hand. It's not a big grill. Mm -hmm. You can control the dial. And also when panic, just turn the thing off. It's fun to have it also when you're having a dinner party and people are like, ooh, flames. That's true, party trick. Yeah. The dangerous task I want to talk about today is flambe. Ooh! <laughs> Exciting. I mean, I always got so excited, like, when you go to restaurants as a kid. I didn't understand what flambe was. I was just like, ooh, fire. So I'm going <laughs> to order that because you get to see. It's a spectacle. It's a show. Flambe basically means to ignite your food that has liquor in it. Naturally, it's dangerous because something will be on fire. That something should be your vessel and should never be anything outside of your vessel. The purpose of flambe is to create this like dramatic um, visual impression for to develop like a deep flavor. I think the best way to do flambe is with either a longer match or a multi-purpose lighter which has a longer neck so you have a good distance between your hand and the hot pan. And today we're going to demonstrate flambe with banana foster. So what I want to make sure before doing flambe is that there's no flammable items anywhere around this pan. There's no paper, like no glass, no sharp items, just in case anything happened. If you have like, let's say your microwave here, maybe that's not the best, best stove or not the best place to do flambe because if the fire comes up, it might burn your microwave and yeah. you don't want that. Clothing wise, I would say just make sure you don't have anything that's like draping. So don't wear tassels. Yeah, don't wear tassels when you're flambe. <laughs> I have a uh, dark brown here and then my lighter. Are you ready for the flame? Let's do it. So first thing, I'm gonna turn off the heat, pour in the rum. And usually it lasts for like maybe 10 seconds and the alcohol will naturally burn off and then you're done. It didn't really like take a lot to make a flame. So if you're like not aware or not like being careful with it, things could go wrong. So it's yeah. always better to be safer. The dangerous cooking task that I'm going to be demonstrating today is just chopping very spicy peppers. Mm. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily think of this as a dangerous task, but I've seen burns all over my arms and my face. So mm. 
Step one, one of the most important things I think you should do is always use gloves. I have also like chopped up a scotch bonnet pepper without gloves and then touched my eyes accidentally. And that oh. is a big no-no because then it's, you're just burning for hours. Do you cook a lot with cra crazy spicy peppers? Always, that's a very Jamaican thing. Like oh. we always use spicy peppers and everything. Scotch bonnets go in everything. I like to cut around the pepper, so I just kind of like rotate it. You're avoiding the membrane and those seeds inside the pepper. That's where most of the spice is packed. There's a chemical in the peppers that makes it spicy called capsaicin. The more that a uh, pepper has, the spicier it's gonna be. So it's like that white inner yeah. part. This isn't, it's not that white in a scotch bonnet particularly, but you'll notice that in like a jalapeno. If you don't have gloves and you do want to incorporate these peppers yeah. and your hands get too spicy, yeah. you can always make like a mixture out of baking soda and water and you can rub that all into your hands, let it dry and wash it off. Oh. And that'll help to neutralize the capsaicin in the peppers. So this one, it's actually way harder to avoid the seeds in this one. So it's more, in my opinion, it's more about like slicing it. If you slice it in half Ooh. on the vertical part of the pepper, you can kind of scrape out those seeds and just dispose of those. And it just kind of clears out those really spicy seeds in the center. Either use a separate cutting board or slice your spicy peppers last. That way you're not incorporating all that spicy work so hard to eliminate. Peppers can be slippery, so when you're not, you, you know, when you're trying to run through it fast, I've had it, I've had the knife slip too. So oh God, yeah. That could be dangerous. So it's also just kind of, again, like taking your time to do these things Absolutely. as much as you can. Also, if you just want like a little bit of heat infused into like a pasta sauce, for example, sure. you can simply pierce a really hot pepper and just drop it into the sauce rather than exposing any of that inner membrane or allowing for those seeds to come out of the pepper. Like a slow gassing. It's a slow gassing infusion. kind of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And that's on hot peppers, baby. That's it. I want to talk about butchering large fish, flatfish. There's a great big fluke. I mean, that is a big flatfish. I mean, they get a lot bigger than that. Like a halibut mm -hmm. can be like the yeah. size of a person, but fluke, I just had no idea. Yeah, it's not a vegetable where you're going, you know, going down or, or any of that sort. You have to have to do a lot of different movements here. And also when it comes down to is the knife. I'm using a, a fillet knife. I like to use it for flatfish because obviously the knife itself bends. Uh, and so I can get in between the bones here and really just smoothly just make sure I get the best yield out of the filet. If you're not aware of where the bone, pin bones are at, you're not aware of the structure of the animal. Where the know, fins, you know, sometimes exactly. the fins have the spikes. Yeah, Ooh, like all these back ends right here, these are, these are pointy. With cutting boards, it needs to be stable. There's a wet towel underneath these, both of these uh, cutting boards. I have these two towels here. Every time I take a stroke, I'm wiping it down here correctly so it can, the, the knife itself can be cleaned. Also, I'm wearing gloves. And then, you know, taking your time and being able to understand the anatomy of the fish. There's uh, an evident line that's coming up the spine right here, the vertebrae of the fish. This is one fillet, and then this one fillet right here. First, when you make an incision, you wanna, I feel like a doctor. You wanna just follow that line, and you don't wanna dig too deep, you just wanna use the tip of your knife and you gotta take it all the way down, okay? Right here is the collar of the fish. So you wanna just take an incision right over here. What you wanna hear closely is the clicking of the bone when you're bending your knife, okay? So you wanna bend your knife, you wanna lift it, one long stroke, okay? You're not losing yield. You're also using the bones as a guide. Don't do jagged strokes, one long stroke. One long stroke. And you can hear it when you're cutting the knife. You hear the bones. And you just cut through here, and boom. It's one fillet right there. So if you're cutting this improperly, you can get your bones in your fillet, and then you'll just have more time cleaning the fish and getting those bones out. I hate fish bones. I mean, I'm like psychotic about it. I've got like tweezers, pliers, you know, I go at it, like all kinds. And the most important part about filling uh, fish is Chris stood all the way over there. He's a righty, right? So I yeah. stood on his left. Yes. If he were a lefty, I'd have stood on his right. right. That's like 90% of the game. The dangerous task I want to talk about is deep frying, specifically deep frying turkey. Ooh. Yeah, or any big bird. Mm -hmm. I don't have a turkey with me today. I have a chicken, mm -hmm. but the same kind of tips and tricks and technique you can apply to that. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you need to make sure is that you have an appropriate sized 
pot. Whenever your turkey or bird arrives, you leave it whole inside whatever packaging it came. Okay. And then you take the whole bird and put it in your pot. Now second, we need to know how much oil we have to fill. We can do that by not actually adding oil, but filling this pot up with water. So where people go wrong is not using the appropriate amount of oil, most likely using more than it's required. The oil spills over, the turkey has a lot of moisture, mm -hmm. it's hitting on hot oil, mm -hmm. all of that reacts right. and that's what causes the explosion. Okay, so now we have, actually we're only putting in this much oil about. Right. So now we know that when we submerge our bird in hot oil, mm -hmm. it is not going to bubble over. And to be honest, I would even use a deeper pot than what I have right now. How do you usually drop your bird in? For this, I could use a tongue, right? You can do that. So you have extra support, that way you know the bird is not gonna plop into hot oil and splatter. Right. I also recommend wearing gloves, like heat-proof gloves, and then you can gently lower this down. There's a reason why people fry turkey outside. A, it is a large-scale frying that you're doing. Um, B, if there is oil spill, you kind of don't want it happening in your kitchen. If you do it outside, you know, the ground is a much better place to kind of absorb the oil. Oil spills on the stove can be dangerous. And also, it's just difficult to clean. If you could clean it like instantly, that's the best. But if you can't, putting salt on top of it, like for, it's a good temporary method. Or flour. I've used all-purpose flour. All in all, if you are deep frying a whole bird or turkey, just make sure you're using an appropriate size pot that has enough height to it. Tentatively measure out how much oil you're going to use. Have some strong, sturdy tongs and tools that is going to help you lower your turkey in the hot oil and then remove it safely out of the hot oil as well. There's no smart way to cut yourself and you're almost guaranteed to cut yourself on something like so stupid, all right? But squash, hard winter squash is one of those things. Like it sends people to the hospital Just every story. single day. Story. That skin is so hard. If you're using a dull knife, you're gonna have to apply so much force to it. If you slip, if your cutting board slips, okay, if the cutting board surface is, you know, kind of slick like this, the squash can slide right off of it. Anything can happen. And squash has that up thing in it where it's like it's like weirdly like starchy yet slippery inside so it kind of does that same thing that butter does where it's like your knife will suddenly just like shoot right through it it's real the danger is real so this is like what not to do again this is a very slick surface the squash is going to want to kind of shoot across this like as i'm applying force to it there's nothing underneath it you know these acrylic boards are great for cutting proteins but that's it all right throw it over your shoulder all right well there could have been somebody behind me. See, that's <laughs> why it's dangerous. So first things first, something that's like non-slip. This is some of that shelf liner material. I just keep this like with my kit all the time. So the next thing is, see already this wooden surface, it's a little bit more abrasive than that acrylic surface, okay? So this is not moving, and then the squash is gonna have a harder time moving. I wanna trim the top, okay? I wanna trim the bottom. It's, it's very hard in there, so you wanna make sure you know, you're kind of getting past that. At this point, I'm gonna treat the squash as though it's like two different things, okay? I almost don't have to use my knife again. A good quality Y peeler is gonna allow you to take the right amount of peel off without using your knife. And how much better is that? And how much safer is that? It's really hard to send yourself to the hospital with this. Somebody's probably done it, but like there's like a plaque with that person's yeah, yeah, face yeah, yeah, on yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah. in the ER. You don't want to be that guy though. Cause it's, they are the one. <laughs> Have you noticed that all the cuts I made, I was driving the knife from a high point down to the cutting board. I didn't go like this and try to muscle through it this way. I'm not laying it flat and kind of going like this. Cause if I slip, Boom, bye-bye, Harold. Always, you know, the claw, claw Start starting high and going down. Now you have a stable surface to cut this in half and you can actually do it evenly. And now you're good to go. Get yourself some of this shit. This is fire, yeah. You can make all the mistakes, take your time, be patient with yourself and, and not try to rush through things. It's just all these little practices that you have to be in the habit of. And when you do, you know, you're able to minimize and compartmentalize risk. Use appropriate tools, have enough space, don't wear tassels, 
and you should be fine. No, no dull knives. knives, please. <laughs>